First up this afternoon, more oil marketing firms are expected to shut down the operations in the weeks ahead. Well, what they describe as industry challenges, some operators took a hit last year due to the rising cost of operations and regulatory requirements. George Raffi has more. The woes of the oil marketing firms have been compounded by the new payment terms put forward by importers of finished petroleum products. There's a departure from the old practice where products are sold on credit. Their situation has been compounded by the intense competition when it comes to pricing of products. And now some of the firms are losing out because they cannot sell more volumes to break even. Some already entered into major talks with others looking at being taken over by another firm. The Ghana Revenue Authority has also revised the way it collect taxes from the sector to an advanced payment, a move that is hurting most of the firms operating in the sector. For some of the industry watchers, it was just a matter of time following the full takeoff of the price deregulation policy, as some of the companies that hid behind government subsidies are now being exposed. There is currently more than 100 oil marketing companies in the country. Joy Business is learning that even with some of the big players in the industry, they are currently struggling based on the recent adjustment in prices of petroleum products by the oil marketing companies. It is clear that most of them have still absorbed a fraction of the cost in order to stay in business to ensure that they don't lose out on the market when it comes to marketing or selling of their products. Well, uh, some quick update on fuel prices. Market leader Guel has increased the price of petroleum products at the pumps. It went up over the weekend. A little of petrol is going for 10 cities, 99 pesos, which is in line with the current market condition. Diesel is going for 13 cities, 39 pesos. Now, uh, based on the pricing formula for the industry, it's clear that most of the oil marketing companies have absorbed a fraction of the cost. Now, this means prices should have been more than what we are seeing now. And as fuel prices go up, transfer fares are expected to go up uh, by some 10%. That's uh, later in the week. That's if unionized operators, the Ghana Private Road Transport Union and the Ghana Road Transport Coordinating Council are able to get the transport minister's blessings on this margin of increase at a crunch meeting this Wednesday. Now, at a meeting between the operators and the transport minister last Friday, there was an agreement that the fares should be reviewed. However, a final deal was not reached on the margin of increase. Now, the meeting also agreed that time has come for some taxes on fuel to be reviewed. And we'll be following that for you uh, as we anticipate an announcement by uh, commercial transport operators of an increase in transport fares. Now, some of the country's foreign investors are pushing for transparency and discipline with government's expenditure to help restore confidence in the economy. They say these are some of their immediate concerns rather than Ghana signing up to an IMF program to stabilize the situation. Investment analyst Mike Kobler has been giving details on investor concerns about the economy. Take a listen to what he said on PM Express Business Edition. I don't think that the IMF came up with something quite different from what we're prescribing for ourselves except that we are thrown so much mud at a system that nobody believed what we were saying and nobody was hearing us internally. Where we are today, I do not believe that the investors are crying out loud and saying that we need to have policy credibility. If investors want to see the hard facts. We need to carry the investors along to know what we are doing. On the fiscal side, um, are we really cutting down expenditure as we are expected to cut? Are we producing the kind of discipline that we are? And, and mind you, in any situation, any, any government's headache is being able to balance growth and, and inflation. And we are not in ordinary times. I mean, inflation is all over the place. Um, the COVID situation, the Ukraine uh, war, Russian war, has brought it into with difficulties across the world. Question is that how do we put in measures to ameliorate this for our citizenry, to, to make uh, the situation a bit terrible for our citizens? Can we cut down expenditure? Can we cut down some of the things that we are doing, the growth areas that we are looking at, and make sure that people are a bit more comfortable? Because this situation is a very dire situation. And as much as you, you write to the IMF, IMF will come up with its own restrictions in terms of borrowing, in terms of employment cuts, 
And it's, it's, it's really not going to solve a lot of our problems. Question is that are we in ourselves, can we look internally and be disciplined enough and to cut out the areas that are, we are wasting and to be able to save enough to be able to give the, that, the investors the confidence that we have? And you have the investment analyst, Mike Kobler. A foreign direct investment to African countries hit a record $83 billion in 2021, according to Anter's World Investment Report 2022. Now, this was more than double the amount reported in 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic weighed heavily on investment flows to the continent. Despite the strong growth, the investment flows to Africa accounted for only 5.2% of global FDI up from 4.1% in 2020, while most African countries saw a moderate rise in FDIs in 2021, around 45% of the total was due to an intra-firm financial transaction in South Africa. In terms of sub-regions, South Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, and West Africa saw their investment flows rise, whilst those to Central Africa remained flat and North Africa registered a decline. The largest holders of foreign assets in Africa remained European, led by investors in the United Kingdom, that's uh, $65 billion, and France, uh, which was $60 billion. We'll stay on this uh, topic a little while longer uh, because uh, we are getting closer to the Africa Investment Risk Summit and uh, Investment Risk Com and Compliance Summit, which is uh, expected to take place on the 5th of July. In London, UK, the summit organized by Emerging Business Intelligence and Innovation Group seeks to unlock the huge potential of African businesses and offer practical solutions to obstacles faced by investors. Glad to be joined by one of the speakers, Dr. Jackie Chimhanzi, who is CEO African Leadership Institute, who will be addressing issues of good governance and how that increases the likelihood of investments. Great to have you on our program uh, this afternoon. Uh, governance and risk management seem to be at the fore of development for many African countries. You're a seasoned strategist with over 20 years of experience. What are some of the best strategies to promote good governance in Africa? Good afternoon and thank you very much for having me to discuss this topic that I'm very, very passionate about. Uh, you ask a very good question, but before I answer it, it might be good to define what we mean by governance. So governance is really the architecture of systems, processes, and tools that are deployed to control an organization or even a country. We talk a lot about Africa needing strong institutions. So really governance is about strong institutions and it's about institution building. Uh, and that's why I'm so passionate about it because I think there's a link between good governance, strong institutions, and sound development outcomes. Your question specifically is about the kind of strategies that can be deployed to promote good governance. There are many that are available to any company. Uh, for example, just having ethical leadership at the top and setting the right tone at the top in terms of what is tolerated or what is not tolerated. So having the right values in place and the right culture in place. But also having a sound board. So putting together a board of experienced people who can help the executives in navigating uh, the environments within which they operate. Also proactively managing risk and mitigating risk. So not just uh, being prepared for risks that may come your way, but having tools in place to help mitigate that risk. Uh, complying with legislation is another way that uh, companies can put in place good governance. So compliance is a very important aspect of good governance and also reporting on performance. So those are some of the tools that are available to any company. And hopefully when you put these things in place, that should bring about accountability, transparency and sustainability. Yeah, I, and I, I want you to tell us a, a little bit more about how good governance can improve the performance of businesses in emerging mm -hmm. markets, particularly across Africa. Mm, absolutely. So good governance is important for businesses anywhere in the world. But I would argue that even more so in emerging markets and even so in Africa. And the reason for this is because we all know that Africa presents large, untapped, significant markets. We know that Africa presents huge scope for growth. We know that businesses that come into African markets, they want to grow. They want to raise funds to finance their growth. Mm. So it's very difficult to fund your growth or to access capital when you don't have your governance in order. So you need to clean up, put your house in order before you can go into the investment markets to raise capital. But also we know that Africa is seen as a high risk market 
So obviously investors want to put their money in organizations where they feel safe, where they feel they'll know how their monies are being deployed. So it's important to mitigate that perception of risk by putting in place governance structures. So, so that's why it is particularly important. So for example, if I give you an example of what an audit committee, an audit and risk committee does, their role is really to make sure that the organization has got risk controls in place. The board has got the role to ensure that the strategies in place make sense, that mm. they'll ensure growth and make sure that the executives are implementing all those strategies. So I think just from those two examples I've given you, you can see why it would follow that companies that follow this would inevitably have good performance. So uh, businesses usually complain of limited resources and prefer to allocate their limited resources to big ticket items. And mm -hmm. in your opinion, how costly is corporate governance? Are companies better off without it? Wow, that's an interesting question. Uh, it, it can be costly for sure. Firstly, the boards have to be paid, right? <laughs> it's not charity, so you have to pay the board. Uh, if you're a listed entity, there's a cost to being listed on the stock exchange. Uh, you need auditors, you need to produce annual reports. So, so there is a cost to it. But I would say on balance, uh, the benefits outweigh the costs. You know, so th there's no substitute for building a strong brand that is based on, on being a, a an organization that is reputable. There's no substitute for, for, for having that image and brand in the marketplace. So I don't think we should see uh, corporate governance as a nice to have. I think we need to move towards seeing it as a fundamental, as a basic requirement that needs to be in place. And the other thing as well that you see now is that the cost of compliance is getting higher. So yes, there's fiduciary compliance, but increasingly with ESG issues on the agenda, on the, on the horizon, as you've seen, uh, environmental social governance issues, there is greater requirement to comply, to make sure that you're ethical, to make sure that you've got gender diversity, to make sure that you don't have child labor in your supply chains, to make sure that you're reducing your carbon emissions. So the cost of compliance is increasing. But I think companies want to be part of uh, the United Nations, the Global Compact, they want to be signatories because they also want to be seen to be mm. good corporate citizens. Yes. Well, as a speaker at the Africa Investment Risk and Compliance Summit, what are your overall expectations of the summit and what should those attending expect? I think the summit, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's timely. I think it's very relevant. My expectation is that it will highlight what African companies and even countries need to do to position themselves for greater investment levels. I think Africa has got a lot going for it. We speak about the youth bulge, we speak about the youthful population, there's the AFCFTA. Africa has an abundance of natural resources that can help the world migrate to a green economy. But unless we have governance in place, all of these opportunities will not translate to real prospects. And I think we need to move beyond Africa having opportunities to Africa actually realizing the opportunities. And a lot will depend on governance. All right. Uh, great thoughts there. Dr. Jackie Chimhanzi, CEO of the African Leadership Institute, speaking to us ahead of the Africa Investment Risk and Compliance Summit set to take place on the 5th of July in the UK. Uh, thanks very much indeed for your time uh, this afternoon. Thank well, you. we are heavy on investments. Uh, and just in case you are investing in T-bills, this should interest you. Government exceeded its treasury bill sale target by 16.5% a week after failing to achieve the target for the auctioning of the short-term securities. However, interest rates continue to surge, surpassing the 24%. Uh, surpassing 24 Here with an update as we begin a new week is Patrick Edemagama, who is head of trading at Republic Securities. Uh, great stuff uh, at the end of last week. Update us, Patrick, on how trading fared. Okay, good afternoon, Darrell. So on the money market, government raised a total of 1.5 billion against a target of 1.3 billion Ghana cities, recording an oversubscription of 13.55%. On the 91 day, it's close at 24.68, but we should note that the uh, bids as high as 25.5 were accepted. And then for the 182 day, it close at 25.98, but bids as high as 26.5 were accepted. Um, we can also see the control measure coming in where a number of bids were rejected, about 39.3 million Ghana cities bids were rejected uh, on the market. So we, 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 we should see that the controls are coming in um, 
bit by bit. Well, uh, some analysis I read before the show uh, showed that there is more interest in the 91-day bills. Why is that? Well, we, we can see that investors um, now understand that interest rates are repricing very fast on the market. So it's better for an investor who thinks that the economic issues will continue to hold a, 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 an investment for a very shorter time and hop onto another uh, expecting to get a higher yield. So interest rate repricing could be um, a major reason why this is happening instead of holding for the long time. And, and how long before we see some stability on the treasury market? Uh, is this flip-flop going to continue for government? One week they meet the target, the next they don't. What are the dynamics in play? Well, we are beginning to see some level of stability in the primary market where BBs that are quoting uh, high rates have been rejected and the rates have been kept around 24 to 25%. But on the secondary market, it's a different level. We are not able to see or cite any stability at all. Investors are still pegging their rates um, uh, to the inflation. And until inflation is checked, we don't expect uh, that stability on the secondary market. Mm. Uh, well, let's turn to the stock market, Patrick. Uh, Benso Oil Palm Plantation expected to close higher this week on the Ghana Stock Exchange due to rising demand for shares of the agro processing firm. What's your preview at your end? Well, yes, we, we, we expect that. However, um, the level of supply on the market is really low for Benso Oil Palm and some other equities like Access Bank. Um, so though there is demand, uh, investors are not supplying as fast as they should supply. So we can expect the, the market to experience some pressure this week where some stocks will hit new year lows. And uh, we expect some investors to also take advantage of the low or I'll say the relatively low price securities to take some positions now and expect the market to do well in the future. All right. Appreciate your uh, analysis always. Patrick Agama, head of Thank trading you. at Republic Securities. Enjoy the rest of the week. Let's turn to other news. The UK Ghana Chamber of Commerce has indicated that the cut in flights by British Airways from seven days to five has had little impact on the businesses of members. According to its executive director, Ajoba Chiama, members of the chamber are coping with the changes made by the airline. There's more in this report. Yeah, and Scott Ladies event. Ajoba Chiama, executive director, revealed that there are further engagement with the British Airways on the way forward. So with British Airways, British Airways um, is a member of our chamber. So we've had a conversation with them about this and it's not peculiar to Ghana only. It's a part of uh, restructuring of their global operations. So flights have been cut all over the world. And as soon as the tide turns for the business, we'll be back to seven flights a week. Um, to the extent that it's the only direct flight to the UK, yes. But the thing is that it can't be helped. So um, for our member businesses, for those who need to fly to the direct, sorry, direct to the UK, um, if you can get a seat, lucky, but then otherwise you'll have to transit to another um, um, national career for another country. The Royal Ascot Ladies event, she indicated as a corporate social responsibility targeted to help improve Ghana's health sector. According to her, the event will aid in raising funds that will be channeled into an investment of the clinical trials units at the University of Ghana Medical Center. The Royal Ascot um, event in the UK is a very iconic event that is patronized by the Queen herself. She's the patron and she attends herself every year. And it's an event in the UK that has been running since the 1700s. We're looking for a, an event that we could tie to a charitable cause that the Chamber can champion. And we thought, if we are promoting the UK in Ghana, then why don't we host an Ascot experience on the Ladies' Day? Because Ascot's uh, races have been running all of this week in the UK, and today is the Ladies' Day at Ascot in the, in, in, the, in the UK. Dr. Christian O, head of the intensive care unit of the University of Ghana Medical Center, described the move as necessary to improve Ghana's health sector. As Ajaba told you earlier on, this is in aid of the establishment of the University of Ghana Medical Center clinical trials unit. 
First of all, what I want to say is that we've been in this country in the last two and a half years and seen the ravages of COVID-19. Part of that had been the myriad of interventions and agents that had been bandied about that could be used for treatment of the patients. And a lot of them, with time, we realized did not work. All right, we started with fuel prices. We are going to end with a story on fuel. The National Petroleum Authority has cautioned consumers of dangers of patronizing petroleum products on tabletops at an engagement with some journalists in the Bono region in Sunane uh, on pricing, petroleum pricing and quality. The regional manager, Kujia Pia, said they are collaborating with the security uh, to clamp down on such activities which pose risks to public health and safety. Petro Semevo has more. The media engagement for journalists in the Bono region in Sunyane afforded officials from the National Petroleum Authority the opportunity to explain the petroleum pricing formula post deregulation and fuel quality. Abbas Ibrahim Tasunti, head of economic regulation at the NPA, said the deregulation policy has relieved the government of the burden of subsidy and ensured the availability of petroleum products on the market. One of the, the purposes of the deregulation policy was to make sure that the supplier is recovering its cost fully and they make the product available for us. So to that extent, we have never had any shortage or scarcity of petroleum products since this policy was implemented. You know, we're used to having the price of petroleum products staying the same almost throughout the year without changing. It makes inflation stable, right? One of the impacts of the price regulation policy, because we keep seeing the prices rising when they are rising, we see, we've seen that it's also affecting inflation. But the other side of the economy is like the premium for which I mentioned. It is targeted at the fishermen. So that subsidy still exists. So for the, but for petrol and diesel, which everyone uses their cars and bikes, it was quite difficult to target that kind of subsidy. And that's how come the subsidy was removed. So it has relieved government of that burden of taking money it could have used for other developmental products, but just to pay for subsidies. Said Ubedela Kutia, the head of quality assurance on his part, explained that the quality of the petroleum products gets compromised when there is interference along the way to the consumer. Normally, you have petroleum products quality being compromised when there is a transfer. Well, if it stays at one place, nothing happens. But when it moves, that is where you start getting challenges. So once the product is formed or transported from either the refinery or the harbor into the storage depot, we perform another stage of quality control checks, which is a verification of the product quality at the retail outlet. When that is done, that is, you always get the product meeting 100% because most of the transfer is through a pipeline where you have limited sources of interferences or contamination. But the same quality cannot be said about petroleum products sold on tabletops in some communities. The Bono Regional Manager of the NPA, Kwejoapia, said they are stepping up measures to ensure public safety and urged consumers to desist from buying from unapproved outlets. We have realized that there are a few along the um, Atebubu, Kwame Danso stretch. You know, these are, uh, let's say, on tarp roads with isolated fuel stations. Certainly, the authority do not condone the sale of petroleum products on tabletops. I mean, apart from the fact that it's hazardous, it also poses a great uh, risk to public health and safety. So we are taking note of these outlets. When we are done, we are going to liaise with a uh, district police commander and then we will have a program to do a soup on one or two. Then it will serve as a deterrent on the others. We will also do some public education for people who want to also purchase fuel from these tabletops. Precious summer for Joy Business, Sunyani. And that's the marketplace. Uh, before we go, we want to show you what's uh, trending on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Uh, the day story is over there, our top story there. Transport fares expected to go up by 10%. As we have indicated, there will be a meeting between uh, the unionized operators and the transport ministry on Wednesday. We expect that them to make a final decision on the uh, prices of transport fares going up. That's uh, by 10 percent. Also, there is no food shortage in uh, Ghana. That's according to the Agric Minister. You can read more on that on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. 
And my name is Daryl Kwao. Thanks for watching. We will be back same time tomorrow.